Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the May 2021 technical presentation organized by IEEE, uh, MTTS, Santa Clara Valley, San Francisco Joint Chapter, also known as MTTSCV. Uh, my name is Utkarshani Krishna, I'm the chairman of this chapter and welcome to the talk today, the title of which is History and Future of Implantable Antennas. And our speaker for today is Dr. Cynthia Furs, who is uh, Professor of Electrical Engineering, uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Utah, Salt Lake City. Uh, she's also a Antenna and Propagation Society Distinguished Lecturer and also a fellow of both the IEEE as well as the National Academy of Inventors. So welcome Dr. Furs. Uh, before we go on to the main talk, we have a few uh, slides uh, to show us the agenda for today. And for that, I would like to call upon our secretary, Mr. Venkata Gade. Venkata. Okay, thank you, Utkash. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Foss. Um, so for um, the agenda today, uh, we will have uh, the meeting notes, uh, COVID-19 update, and uh, we will go over uh, our chapter officers this year, and uh, we will introduce uh, speakers today's speaker's bio and the talk for the today. And uh, we will have question and answer sessions through, like it was mentioned earlier, uh, throughout the talk. Uh, we will take uh, um, time to ask, uh, uh, get some of the questions answered in regular intervals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a, a few things to note, um, this meeting is being recorded and is being broadcast live on Zoom. Uh, links to the recorded video and slides will be sent out to all the registrants. Please keep cameras off and microphones muted to help with the bandwidth issues and background noise. Um, this is especially important when we ask questions, when you, when you are unmuted to ask questions, etc. Please ask your question by using the raise hand reaction button. We will unmute you to ask your question. Please ensure that your display name in Zoom matches to the one you use to register. This will make it easy for us to check you in. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Uh, and and uh, the most important, please support us by becoming a member. Join IEEE, the link is given here. And uh, also join uh, MTTS chapter. Uh, the link is also provided here. We have a hashtag on LinkedIn, MT, uh, MTTSCV hashtag. Please follow it and uh, please uh, um, support IEEE and MTTTS. And next, I would like to uh, invite uh, Tan to cover the next uh, slides. Yeah, so this is this is Tan too. And um, due to the uh, COVID-19 situation, all our in-person meetings are now canceled and we're just doing the Zoom and online webinar format until further notice. Uh, we are hoping to get back to uh, in-person meetings in the summer, but for now, this is the format going forward. Next slide, please. So the chair for the um, chapter is Ukars, who has introduced the speaker earlier. Uh, vice chair is Tom, Mr. Tom McKay, who will come on in a few minutes. And you just listen to Mr. Ben Carter, who is sec secretary, and I'm the treasurer, Tan Tu. Next slide. Uh, I will turn over to Tom. Um, Tom, uh, Utkash, uh, please. Oh, of oh, oh, course. Uh, with that being said, I'll turn it over to um, Joe Kars for the introduction. Well, Kars, are you going to do the introduction or shall I? Or um, Sorry for the confusion, folks. Um, Okay. Uh, yeah, I for a second I couldn't unmute myself, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> because I made uh, Venkara the host. Yeah, I, I think I had to make you co-host explicitly. Sorry okay. for that. <laughs> no worries. So uh, today's uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Cynthia Amphers, who is a fellow of the IEEE and the National Academy of Inventors, and she's a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Utah, Salt Lake City in Utah, USA. Uh, her research interests are the application of electromagnetics to sensing and communication in complex lossy scattering media, such as the human body, 
geophysical prospecting, ionospheric plasma, and complex wiring networks. Dr. Furs is a founder of Livewire Innovation Inc., a spin-off company from her research, uh, commercializing devices to locate intermittent faults on live wires. She has taught electromagnetics, wireless communication, computational electromagnetics, microwave engineering, antenna design, introductory electrical engineering, and engineering entrepreneurship, and has been a leader in the development of the flipped classroom. Dr. Furs is an associate editor for the transactions on antenna and propagation, a member of the IEEE AP Young Professionals Committee, a past administrative committee member for the IEEE AP Society, and a past chair of the IEEE AP Education Committee. She has received numerous teaching and research awards, including the 2020 IEEE Chento Tai Distinguished Educator Award. Uh, in addition to that, I just want to mention that uh, on our website, there's a lot of other resources, a lot of other lectures and such. We will include the link to that when we send out uh, our email as part of our post event engagement. It's definitely worth taking a look at. So the title of today's talk, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the history and future of implantable antennas. Uh, implantable antennas have been used for communication with medical implants for decades. Since then, wireless medical telemetry systems and their associated implantable antennas have expanded rapidly. Uh, these devices now touch virtually every major function in the human body, cardiac pacemakers and defibrillators, uh, neural recording and stimulation devices, cochlear and retinal implants are just a few of the many implantable medical devices available today. Wireless telemetry for these devices is necessary to monitor battery level and device health, upload reprogramming for device function, and download data for patient monitoring. Emerging medical telemetry devices have led to recent advances in the design of small biocompatible antennas that can be implanted in the human body. This talk will track the types of the antennas seen in the past, the technologies that enable these changes, and the prospects for future implantable antennas for medical applications. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it off over to Dr. Furse. Thank you very, very much. And I'm pleased to join you today. Uh, I would actually love to be able to visit in person, but for now, we'll, we'll be remote. So thank you. I did list my website here, emlab.eng.utah.edu. And there are a number of publications in this and my other research areas, as well as links to several videos of various talks. So I'm excited about this area and just kind of wanted to share, yes, I'm from the University of Utah, electrical and computer engineering, uh, high in the mountains above Salt Lake City, Utah. It's a beautiful place to be this time of year. So medical implants do indeed touch many areas of the body, virtually every area of the body now. Pacemakers were actually about the first medical implant applications. And the tradition of the pacemaker, I'm really gonna point this out right now. So here's the, the battery pack. So that, control, that has the battery and the uh, communications, the, the circuits, the whole circuitry is here in this titanium battery pack. It's a couple inches across in general. And then there's a cable Two, power, two part cable that will be implanted into the heart and connected there uh, surgically. And it shocks the heart to keep it either pacing or defibrillating depending on the case. So most often this pacemaker uh, battery pack is actually on the near outside of the body. It's just under the uh, pectoral muscle. So it can be replaced much easier than doing full open heart surgery. But doing this entire process does require full open heart surgery. A newer a newer thing here is an implant that can be directly left in the heart. So there are so many different applications. I'll just kind of take you through each one. So here's the pacemaker, again, with its two part here. And then this is called the leadless pacemaker, where it's really just a small cylinder. It has the two electrodes there and a battery uh, inside. And all of the circuitry is just in this small cylinder. So instead of needing full open heart surgery, they can just inject this up through uh, the artery and implant it directly into the heart where it needs to be. Clearly that's better medically, but as you can imagine from the point of view of a communication or a wireless power transfer system, uh, the second option is actually much more difficult for the engineers. 
The artificial pancreas is another really important uh, feature where you have a glucose sensor outside the body. Typically they wear a hip mounted device about the size of a cell phone or an old style um, recording device. And that provides automatic insulin delivery direct inside the body based on the person's blood sugar. So much better medically than being able to like inject insulin only intermittently throughout the day. The artificial retina is another really exciting application. And that's where there's a camera on the outside of the body, typically worn on glasses, and a transmitter, which transmits uh, directly to the inside of the eye, which picks it up. Inside the eye, there's a stimulator. There's a, um, a set of electrodes that stimulate the back of the eye to the optic nerve to actually be able to make it so the person's able to see rudimentary um, vision. It's not the same value of vision that you would have naturally from an eye, but it's a whole lot better than being able to navigate without any sight at all. The cochlear implant is actually one of the most common of the medical implants these days. And so there's a, again, a recording system on the outside of the body and a transmitter that transmits uh, in, to a stimulator inside the body. The stimulator here is this little coil, that cute little coil right there. So it's very thin and each one of these uh, copper colored things would be an individual electrode. The trick to being able to do neural stimulation is to be able to have as many electrodes as possible generally over a small area so that you are able to make, stimulate more of the natural region and be able to make sounds or sight or whatever else uh, more biologically realistic. Deep brain stimulation is another of the really exciting technologies and that's where you would do not really full open brain surgery, but you drill a hole in the skull and insert a electrode deep into the brain to areas that can use stimulation. The, electro, the battery pack on the outside is very similar, often identical to those used in cardiac pacemakers. And the lead comes up through the neck, is attached underneath the skin above the skull. And that's what uh, controls the deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation is used for Parkinson's, tremor, epilepsy, dystonia, depression, and possibly other psychological disorders. So there are a number of things that direct stimulation to the brain can make an absolute life-saving uh, difference. So here's an example of one of the commonly used uh, electrode arrays. This is the Utah electrode array. Often you'll see it called UEA. It's used for both localized nerve stimulation and uh, recording, both, both of them. And each one of these little pointy things is an individual electrode that's controlled individually. So you're able to either stimulate individually or receive individually. And that's very important to the quality of the neural stimulation and neural recording devices. So I wanted to talk about where this came from. So from a very basic point of view, what ideas led to the antennas that we have today? And what can that teach us about antennas for the future? So bioelectromagnetics is actually a relatively new thing. Now I could argue that there were things back in the 1960s and 1970s, but one of the very first is a coax fed microwave syringe, which is 1980, that's not very long ago. It was used for hyperthermia, which is being able to heat, um, particularly areas where the, there, there have been cancers. It was done for 2450 megahertz. So that's one of the first applications we see of bioelectromagnetics. And it's going to be quite important as we move into uh, further areas of the talk. So remember this uh, coaxial fed microwave syringe. So then in the process of doing wireless, wireless technology, there are actually two major reasons to do it. One is for telemetry, which is transmitting and receiving data. And the other is for wireless power transfer, which is transmitting power. That's done so that you can recharge the battery generally. So both of these are a little bit different and wireless power transfer is almost always done at lower frequencies, whereas telemetry, uh, you need to modulate something up in frequency generally. So I'm going to talk more about telemetry and less about wireless power transfer in this particular talk. So inductive coupling was the first both power and data uh, transmission system. Now, Inductive coupling, you can see plenty of uh, transportation of energy by microwave beam, like clear back in 1964. But 1995 is, for, is where we see the first functional electrical stimulation. So this is transmitting um, signals, but it's for the purpose of stimulation. It was in the kilohertz region, 
and it was transmitting power both up and down using wireless um, wireless power transfer type technologies with these two uh, two coils as shown here. That was 1995. The early RF inductive links we began to see in 1997. One was for the early cortical visual implant. It was at 20 megahertz, and then there became a demand very quickly for coils that would be smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, as we all know, as you make the coil smaller, you make it less efficient, less able to pick up the magnetic fields that it's trying to, trying to do. So it's a, it's a challenge, but the smaller, smaller the coil, the better. Here are two designs. Uh, one of these on the top, this is a printed coil that allows you to get many more turns because the more turns you have, the more uh, signal you can pick up. So a large number of turns made from a printed antenna. And that's pretty exciting, except that this, uh, the printing tends to be more lossy than a true coil. So today, most of the coils are still hand wrapped. This one millimeter cube is really interesting. And you can see there are two designs. One is where the coil is wrapped around this little cube, and the other is where it's just C-shaped. Both of those actually worked quite well as, uh, as pickup coils, but they probably wouldn't work all that well as transmit coils. Now, a helical antenna is another of the interesting antennas that were used for medical applications. The helix, uh, the helical beam antenna was first seen in 1947. It was first used for temperature readings in biological applications in 1997, and then was converted up to the megahertz region at that point by Bill Scanlon. So the solenoid is another type of coil antenna having very good application. The fact that you could read temperature is another important feature in many of our applications. Now, monopole antennas uh, showed up throughout the 80s and 90s. They, of course, were first used in early mobile applications, and they also have been adapted for a number of medical applications, such as this circumference antenna for an implantable medical device. Now, remember I've shown you the pacemaker, and it had titanium battery packs. This is where the titanium battery pack could have a circumferential antenna around it, which could just be held in place with a silicone or plastic uh, housing. So that was an interesting application of the monopole antenna in 2002. Now, I came into this work in 1999, and actually this might be a good place for questions. Uh, any questions about the, some of the earliest medical applications that at least that I'm finding? I see that Tom perhaps has his hand up. Yes, um, you, you mentioned a, a microwave syringe. I, I don't yeah. know what that is. Okay, this uh, coaxial syringe, so a coax of course has an inner conductor and an outer conductor, and you can transmit power to the tip of the coax just by exciting the end, you know, SMA connector on the end. Now in this case, it was a syringe, so the inner conductor is hollow, and that means that you can also inject fluid through this hollow inner conductor, as well as putting in, um, electromagnetic energy, in this case, 2450 megahertz energy. So you can send something in. Often it was done to wash away the, um, you know, like if you were trying to burn something, like do hyper, uh, you might want to be able to wash that away from the tip. And so you yeah. just inject saline in this case. Mm. But again, you'll see it as I, I hit the future section. Thank you. Uh, I, I see a hand up from Mauricio Press. Hey, yes. Um, I just was also wondering if th this, uh, how similar is to the open-ended coaxial probe uh, for dielectric characterization? Oh, really good question. Yeah, this is, ex this is like the open-ended dielectric probe, which of course is also a coax. The difference is that the microwave, when you're trying to do the sensing, you don't want to have a lot of fringing fields or else it really confuses the dielectric measurements. So they make a large ground plane on the outside uh, on the outside conductor. So they make that like as big as a dime. You, there's a dime here too, but you've seen that of course in your dielectric probes and their inner conductors would always be solid, not hollow, but it is exactly the same set of concepts. Um, in one case, we are transmitter, transmitting energy to make heating. In the other case, they actually transmit and receive. So you're getting a reflection and that's what measures the dielectric. So yes, it is a similar thing. Okay, I see, I see a question from Sharam Shafi. 
Shaharam? Yes. Uh, yes. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Uh, yes. was, the, was the uh, syringe used for uh, treating malignant tumor as yes. well? Yes. I see. Yes. Thank you. And, and in fact, there are a number of uh, coaxial probes that are used for either treating malignant tumors or burning other things such as RF cardiac ablation, where you want to be able to burn portions of the heart that might be electrically malfunctioning. So in the case of tumors, they generally will stick the needle into the tumor and try to hit the whole thing. In the case of cardiac ablation, it's generally just tip-based. They just push the tip against the area that they want to burn. But it, okay. it is still very much the same thing too, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I see a question from Abbas. Abbas Sabini, Sabani. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So the question I have, why did you select such a frequency? Is there any way that we can go to the upper frequency? Uh, these are really good questions. And in fact, we're going to talk about the frequencies that are used for medical implants. And that is the, the terrible trade-off, laws of physics problem. So in the case of hyperthermia, the 2450 was chosen, not maybe in general, in this period, because it was a high enough frequency that devices could be relatively small, but it was a low enough frequency that power could be sent into the body well, either for heating or even from external parts of the body to internal. The 2450 was a very commonly used, um, maybe it wasn't the only frequency used for hyperthermia, but it was a very commonly used frequency. So if we had tried to go higher in frequency, the devices would have been smaller, but also the area that would have been heated would have been smaller as well. So 2450, at least for this application, was a good trade-off frequency. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, so those were some of the things that we were seeing throughout the 1970s, 80s, and then early 90s. I actually came into this work in 1999. I had a student, an undergraduate. Oh, I see one more question from Nagar, uh, Najaran. But. Hi, Professor. Um, so I was wondering, did losses in the body tissue have anything to do at all with choosing that particular frequency? Yes. The losses in the body tissue end up being a really big deal with all of these because all of our tissues are highly conduct conductive, actually. They're, we're basically big bags of salt water. So if you use too high a frequency, you can barely transmit any distance at all. You'd be so localized, you know, a few millimeters. So 2450 allows you to go a few centimeters. Okay. So yes, that absolutely had something to do with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my foray into this work began with an undergraduate, Sam. He was in my undergraduate electromagnetics class and he had to miss a little over a week of school because he was having his pacemaker replaced. And part of the reason he was having his pacemaker replaced is they really didn't know if the battery was good or bad. It was just, you know, 10 years needed thing needed to be replaced. And Sam was saying, the trouble is his was, it was not actually a pacemaker, his was a defibrillator. So it only intermittently had to shock his heart. He was very athletic, he was a climber. He liked to climb walls, you know, stone walls like this. And so he said, you know, I don't really know, maybe my battery's fine. And if only I knew, then I wouldn't have to go get pacemaker surgery. This is literally his pacemaker. He brought it to me after his surgery, being cleaned up obviously and sanitized. And this is the pacemaker that Sam had, that Sam wore. So he wanted better communication with a pacemaker so he didn't have to go to the doctor all the time, He'd get adjustments to the, you know, to the signals. And he wanted to be able to have much more control over his heart and his pacemaker himself. So he did his, the first senior project in this area in my group. So I'm going to talk about some of the ideas that are really critical to the implants that we have today. So I showed you several of the antennas, but let's talk about some of the standards. One of the most important standards is how much power you can put into the body in the first place. So if you're trying to burn something, these standards don't apply. But if you are trying to communicate with something, these standards do. So in the 1990s is when we first got our specific absorption rate standard. It was actually developed originally more for cell phones than anything else, but it's a very critical standard for medical implants as well. 
So a specific absorption rate is how much power is absorbed in the body. It's a watts per kilogram. So it's power per um, like square centimeter of tissue. It's given in watts per kilogram and it's averaged over either a one gram standard for the um, for the US or a 10 gram standard for Europe, two different standards, but using the same, the same measurement. So it's a very important standard and was developed again for cell phones, but also is really critical for our implants. So in 1992, that's when there was a neck uh, cell phone lawsuit and it resulted in 1996 in the NCIEEE and then adopted by the FCC uh, C95.1 standard, which says that the SAR will be limited to 1.6 watts per kilogram over a one gram of tissue. Again, a similar standard showing up for Europe. And this was important because we have to be able to say where in the body is the highest amount of power going to be. As antenna engineers, we know that's gonna be right around the feed point, right? So this is, this is controlling how much total power we can put into our system. And then of course, there's a size versus frequency problem. The pacemaker battery packs today are two to four centimeters on a side, little bits of difference, but roughly that range. And suppose that we wanted to put in a half wave dipole. We're not going to, but let's suppose we wanted a half wave dipole at 20 megahertz in the body. So this is in body tissue. The lossiness actually helps us here. Um, the half wavelength would be 41 centimeters, but at 403 megahertz, uh, the half wavelength would be five centimeters. Okay, so five centimeters is pretty reasonable. We can put that on the body, but we can't put 41 centimeters. We might like the lower frequency because that allows more energy to pass into the body. So here's the trade-off just in skin for 20 megahertz and how much of that will pass into the body versus 403 megahertz and how much that will pass into the body. So we like the lower frequencies for being able to transmit a distance, but we like the higher frequencies for being able to make a smaller antenna. So the telemetry frequencies that were chosen, originally they were the ISM, Industrious, Industrial Scientific Medical Bands. They were established in 1947. The bands that were most applicable in this case are 433, 915, and 2450 megahertz. There's our 2450 again. At the time, there wasn't a dedicated medical band. So these three bands were the ones that were chosen and 2450 is kind of the highest feasible band for being able to do antenna sizes in the body. Now, after that, in 1999, a dedicated mix, which is Medical Implant Communication Services band was established. It goes from 402 to 405 megahertz. It's since been expanded from 401 to 406. Now you're going to see throughout my talks, and you'll see this with others doing implantable electronics. These are the bands that we actually want to use in practice, but certainly in my university lab, I'm not actually going to test with these bands. So we most often design our antennas at 433 megahertz, for the purpose of being able to test them. Although the bands that we're shooting for medically are the 401 to 406. And that was established in 2009. So those two standards were really important in the choice of the implants and how they're going to develop throughout, throughout time. As soon as you've chosen a frequency, you've basically defined the size of antenna that you can produce. And as soon as you've chosen how much power, like the SAR guideline, C95.1 SAR guideline, that has chosen how much total power you can have going forward. So those two things are absolutely critical to the antenna engineer. In addition, I'll note that throughout this period, the development of simulation and design tools allowed us to work to move away from the very, very simplified designs doing much more advanced antenna designs. So the development of numerical electromagnetics, which also was pretty rampant throughout the 1990s, was really critical to the forward movement of this, uh, this general area. So now let's talk about the antenna types. Since we've got a general idea that we've got a frequency, we've got power, now let's talk about the antenna types. One of the most common and most valuable of the antenna types is the microstrip antenna. As you can imagine, we've got a battery pack, just basically a flat thing, flat metal device. So building a microstrip on top of that is kind of a natural thing to imagine. The first paper on microstrip antennas showed up in 1953. And then in 1995, this book, which summarized the IEEE publications on microstrip antennas was actually really important. Now I'm kind of gonna go like baked little stars here. In 1995, we didn't have the internet. So the thing that really impacted people were books like this. Books were actually really important. IEEE Explorer wasn't even around for us. 
So this book I'm going to argue actually had a really significant impact on the microstrip antenna designs that we see in all areas, including very much medical implants. So the first paper on the planar inverted F antenna, which is a type of microstrip antenna, the FIFA antenna, showed up in 1982, but it's in Japanese. So it wasn't picked up as quickly in the United States as it might otherwise have been. Once it was, however, it became one of the stars in the, in the implantable electronics. So a PIFA is a planar inverted F antenna. That's where the pacemaker body, this titanium battery pack, uh, acts like the ground plane for the antenna. The inverted F is where you have a feed and a ground pin, and these can be either left, right, or right, left, just depending. I think I generally have my ground pin over here on the left and my feed on the right, but it could go either direction. So you've got these two things and this antenna radiator on top, which could be any, any shape, tends to radiate upwards as opposed to out to the side. So that's a type of antenna. Now, what we're going to talk about is how we control the location of the feet in the ground and the shape and size of the antenna radiator. Pacemaker body is already going to be set. So uh, the pacemaker body that Sam had here was like so. And then we just made metal, metal, metal uh, shapes the same size so that we could test our antenna on them. So one of the important things that you can do to shrink this antenna is to use a substrate material here that has a larger dielectric constant because that effectively changes the apparent electrical um, wavelength in that part of the, the system. So the substrate is very important. Now the substrate has to be both biocompatible electrically compatible, you have to be able to glue, literally glue it onto this pacemaker body, and you have to be able to attach this radiator on the top. So there actually were a relatively limited number of substrates, and they were either ceramics or they were plastics, basically. Glass might also have been a possibility, but it doesn't glue well. So in order for something to be biocompatible, the idea is for the molecules in this material to be inert, to be held in place so well that they don't become free floating throughout the body. Or if they were to become free floating throughout the body, they need to not be toxic. They need to be non-toxic. So titanium is one of those things where the materials do not um, leave the titanium plate. Okay, so we have an antenna type. We're going to use a PIFA. And the implant case size is actually a really, the next important thing to, to find the size and the type of antennas. So in 1983, the finite ground plane became a really big deal. So you had this planar antenna on top. And if you had an infinite ground plane, it acted a certain way. But if you have a finite ground plane, it actually changes things substantially. As you can imagine, with the small size of our pacemakers, the work that was done on the finite ground plane throughout the 1980s actually really impacted the science of the antennas uh, for these devices as well. Now let's talk a bit about the size miniaturization. So we talked about why we might like to have had a half-wave dipole antenna, and let's pretend that that's what I still want, although it's not really what I'm going to get. The ground pin, and I'm showing the ground pin kind of put here on the end of the antenna, acts like a, a virtual ground. So it gives you a virtual antenna on the other side of the ground plane. Now remember that part of the antenna doesn't actually radiate, but it does change the electrical uh, behavior of the antenna. So the ground is actually a really important feature in the miniaturization of this antenna. The location of the feed is very important for tuning the antenna. The distance between the ground and the feed allows you to control the impedance of this antenna substantially. So the ground helps, the ground and the size controls the frequency, the location of the feed tends to control the impedance. So in addition to having a ground and a feed, we are going to twist this antenna up to make it apparently smaller. So uh, there are a couple of different ways you might twist this up. So we considered by 2002, this is what we were doing. We're doing a combination of spirals and serpentines. We were doing super straight materials that might not necessarily be uniform and we are using the resonant frequency uh, design using a PIFA and the finite ground plane was a titanium pacemaker. So all of the technology that was coming out in microstrip antennas found its way very quickly into the implantable antenna world. So we wanna twist this antenna up to make it smaller. It's gonna have a ground and a feed. So the ground helps you know, make a doubling of the antenna, that's great. But our two choices basically are being able to spiral it or serpentine it. 
So when you try both of these, it's actually really interesting why they work the way they do. So the spiral antenna ends up being the better of the two. And the main reason for that is because as you can see from these pictures, there is substantial coupling between the arms of these antennas. It's really pretty significant. And so if you use a spiral, you kind of have the area that has the lowest current coupling to the area of the highest current, which is good. If you use a serpentine antenna, you have two areas of high current coupling to each other, which isn't as good. So the spiral antenna happens to just work better in a coupling arrangement like this. Now, I mentioned the feed and ground pins can help to tune the antenna. The distance between them and the location of the ground really controls the frequency a lot. And the, and the location of the ground can, tends to control its resonance. It's really changing its impedance in order to be able to uh, adjust the resonance. So in, the next thing is the concept of putting this antenna in the body. But let me just stop here for a minute and see if there are any questions about the section to this point. Any questions to this point? Okay, Emily. I see a question from Emily Burnside. No? Okay, cool. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. There's some issues unmuting. Um, so I did have a question. You spoke a little bit about safety with SAR. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you were to look at a device that was primarily outputting magnetic fields and uh, doing this below 200 kilohertz, mm -hmm. is there another safety standard that would be more applicable than SAR? And I'm so glad you sent me this question earlier by email. Yes, there is actually. <laughs> so the SAR guideline is, a power deposition guideline, and it's based on the electric field. It's conductivity times the magnitude of the electric field squared divided by um, the density of the tissue. There's a factor of two in there also. So the SAR is based on the electric field. If you have coupled electric and magnetic fields, it's still the right guideline. So if you're at the higher frequencies, the SAR guideline is the thing to use. But if you're at the lower frequencies, then yes, there is a guideline based on magnetic fields. And I was not able to find the magnitudes, but the guideline is C95.4. So uh, I actually was trying to get a download of this for you, but look for the, the C95.4, apparently is the one that controls the magnetic fields. It's the same one that is used for MRI scanners uh, to be able to figure out how much field you can have at different frequencies. Now, just like the electric field guidelines, these are very frequency dependent. So uh, we'll have to dig out that guideline for you, but it's, it's the C95.4. Great, thank you so much, that's so helpful. Okay, hope, hope we can find that one. I, I was hoping I could get it today, but I don't have it yet. Okay, uh, Shahara? Yes, I was wondering if there are uh any type of realized gain or radiation efficiency that you can comment on these, uh, these type of antennas achieve? Mm. So the gain, as in being able to make these more directional, these are not very directional antennas because they do end up being relatively small. So it's really hard to get directionality with any of these radiators. So the gain of these antennas is pretty small. And in fact, these antennas are really horrible antennas. They're quite inefficient, as we're going to talk here, um, because of the lossy body. So they're quite inefficient. They're quite small. They have to be wrapped up. They're kind of really crappy antennas. So um, no, we don't get much in the way of gain. The radiation from these is pretty much, you know, just a um, a teardrop straight up, mm. and the um, polarization is based on the the shape of the radiator. So no, we don't get much in the way of gain with these antennas, I'm afraid. They're poor. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jay. Yes, Dr. First, I was wondering when you implant a device, like let's say a pacemaker or anything else, how do you make sure it's, does it have to be locked in where it cannot move even a millimeter over years and years for whatever purpose, let's say it's heating at a focused point or how does that work? How do they guarantee the exact position in the human body for a long time? That's a serious problem. And in fact, you really can't. 
So human bodies change, we breathe, we move. In fact, there's, there's this thing called the twiddle factor where if you put the antenna in your shoulder, like right here, um, which is where it is. So if the, ba the battery pack is there. People tend to just mess with it, like rub it, and it tends to make it spiral and then break the connector. So people move, uh, you play tennis, you move. So the antenna is locked in place on the titanium battery pack in these designs. So the antenna doesn't have to stretch, bend, or move, but the antenna within the body does. So uh, definitely, and if you lie down, if you set up, you know, whatever you're doing differently. So you can imagine that if you have only one radiator, you are going to have to have a reception system pretty much directly above it. So that's why in all the coil systems, you see like on the, the cochlear implant and the optical implant I showed you, the coil is just right outside the head, whereas the uh, inner coil is directly below it. So you kind of have to make some effort to align things, but no, things in a body do not hold still. Um, they do move. You can't expect to have millimeter precision. I doubt you can have centimeter precision. Wow. People gain wow. weight, they lose weight. Um, Detuning these antennas is a serious problem. Very common serious yeah. problem. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Amit. I see a question from Amit Kumar. Hi. Hi. So, uh... Is this, uh, is this antenna can be made on the flexible substrate like uh, like uh, people are using additive uh, uh, 3D printing like that so that uh, uh, so when uh, when the people are bending then there will be uh, less of uh, uh, effect on the radiation pattern. Mm. Um, that's actually a really good and interesting question and when we get to the future part I'll actually show you what we are doing with uh, flexible materials. It's not really a flexible substrate but I will show you. Um, you also will find a bunch of really cool applications for antennas that are actually that are put on stickers on the outside of the body and they do bend, stretch and move. So there are plenty of applications for antennas that bend, stretch and move. In this case, the titanium battery pack is not flexible. It's a hard thing. So there's no point in making the antenna flexible if the thing you're gonna stick it on is solid. So in all of these applications, the antenna is solid and is intended not to move and really doesn't, I mean, it may shift around in the body, but the antenna itself doesn't bend and change. Okay, I see a question, let's see, a question from Jihan. Uh, Jihan, you can unmute. Yeah, thank you. Um, hello, ma'am. So you, you mentioned about the use of titanium because of its biocompatibility and how it can enhance the electric field towards the antenna radiator. But could it be like um, different layers, like another, uh, like we sometimes use plasmonic structures to increase the electric characteristics within a substrate. So can this be like a multi-layered thing? Yes, in fact, they really are multi-layered. And yes, there are definitely things that could be done with non-uniform materials like the metamaterials in both the substrate and the superstrate, which we'll be talking about in a minute. So these are actually very much a sandwiched device. So you've got the ground plane, which is titanium because that's what's used medically. You've got a substrate, you've got the radiator, and you've got a superstrate. So it is already like a sandwich. And yes, there are a number of things you could do with this. So yes. And actually, am I causing trouble by just answering the questions when you might have been trying to unmute people? Uh, no, 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 Professor. Um, you're okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. I see a question from Greg Carmen. Uh, Greg, um, please unmute yourself. Hey, Cindy, great talk so far. Real quick question for you. I, I see the antennas you're talking about for the pacemaker that we're looking at here it's appear to be more electric field based. I guess that's possible mm -hmm. because it's near the skin surface. Mm -hmm. For really deep in plant antennas like the one you saw, you showed in the heart, wouldn't inductive coupling be a lot better to transmit through? Can you just comment on that? Yeah. So inductive coupling is commonly used and it is actually the most commonly used today. The limitations of inductive coupling are the efficiency and the distance. 
So, you know, with inductive coupling, you're putting a current in the coil that creates a magnetic field and the magnetic field tends to spread out. Think of it kind of like the shape of a trumpet. And then you have this tiny antenna on the inside that's trying to pick that up. So generally what you'll have is a small antenna inside where the implant is and a substantially larger antenna on the outside, typical of wireless power transfer applications. Um, and that's good, but it is fairly inefficient and it really only works at the lower frequencies. So you're right, there are both magnetic field transmitters and electric field transmitters. The ones I'm showing you are electric field based. And, and as a follow-up yeah, as a follow-up question, I'm assuming the ones that are embedded deep in, you probably they're fairly lossy also because of conductive losses in the coils too, right? Yes, they are. Okay, thank you Absolutely. so much. Great. Yeah, so we would love to be able to get deeper and deeper, but as you see, fortunately, uh, the doctors are actually happier having the battery pack closer to the surface of the body because the battery pack's the part that has to be replaced more. So surgically, it's no big deal to you know cut the chest, even cut the muscle, separate the muscle and put a new battery pack in. They don't have to actually get to the heart. So they tend to keep the battery pack close to the surface of the body for medical reasons as well. Um, okay, so someone with an email, Sissaman at Gmail, has had your hand up for some time. Yeah, please unmute. Um, Sisomen and Jimmy. Yes, uh, thanks for taking my uh, my question. Uh, great talk, Professor. I, I just wondered if it would be possible to castellate the uh, the antenna around the uh, the periphery, so there would be no or less need less a need for the coil. So that's a totally good question as well. And remember the first, uh, when I was talking about the monopole antennas, there was actually an antenna on the circumference of the pacemaker. So yes, yes making a circumferential antenna is a possibility as well. The disadvantage of that is kind of the same disadvantage of doing our sandwiched material, that you're making the medical device a little bit larger, in that case in circumference. In our case, we're actually making it a little bit thicker. When you have medical things, you almost always want them smaller. So both of these things increase the size. Uh, the inductive coupling has an advantage that way that you really can make a very tiny, very thin coil that is probably less impact on the total size of this device. So there is some advantage there with the inductive coupling. But Thank you. Doing a circumferential is perfectly feasible. Okay, Thank Banu, you. Has, Banu has had hand up for some time. Uh, Banu, please unmute. Hi, hi, professor. Uh, I have a question. Exactly related to the uh, polarization of the antenna. I mean, just now, uh, am I audible? Yes, mm -hmm. we hear yes. you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, regarding the polarization, how exactly the polarization of the antenna is uh, uh, as an important aspect here? Just now, in the spiral antenna compared to the serpent, as you told, like uh, the spiral antenna is preferable. Is it because the polarization, because normally spiral antennas do provide circular polarization, yes. or else because the serpent shape, uh, as you have pointed out, there were exactly two hot spots of uh, 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 excitation. So that uh, does that mean because the uh, because it is less power efficient, because it effectively radiates at two different frequencies? Mm. So these are really good questions. The polarization is determined by the shape of the radiator, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, you, could you could have linear, um, but circular is better in virtually all of these cases. And that's because suppose you did use a linear radiator, like just a monopole antenna that was straight. Well, that'd be all grand, except that as soon as the signal goes out and starts reflecting around in the body, there's a lot of stuff to reflect off in there. Um, it's going to change it from a linear polarization to a circular polarization or approximately circular polarization anyway. So your receiver antenna on the outside is going to be circular. Same thing, if you're trying to transmit into the body, you virtually can't transmit in a linear polarization. You may start with linear, but as it moves around inside the body with reflection, it's going to end up being circularly polarized. So virtually all these antennas have to function circularly polarized. Now the spiral of course did. And the serpentine isn't bad for being circularly polarized either because there are enough kind of side bars on a serpentine. So you really are going to end up with a circular polarization. And so you might as well start with a circular polarization in the first place. So yeah, we go circular. Um, Martin has had his hand up for some time. 
Yeah, hi, Professor. Um, I, I also have a question regarding the SAR limits because I remember the um, standards talking about the SAR also in terms of averaging over like half an hour of time as mm -hmm. well. I wonder, I mean, it sounds a little weird. Does that mean we can actually have a very high SAR for one second and zero mm -hmm. SAR for the rest of half an hour, then it's still okay? It doesn't quite make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there actually is a really interesting history of SAR guidelines and they are based on heating in the body, but not localized heating in the body. They actually are, are originally based, the field guidelines that we have in general, are based on how much heat your body is able to dissipate from the sun, See, heat stroke. Okay. That's what they were originally based on. And so if you get a little teeny bit of heat, like if you stand in the sun for a second and in the shade for the rest of the time, you feel like you're in the shade. So even though right. that may have many reasons that that doesn't make a lot of sense, that is how they are. Now, in, okay. the, case of, in the case of antennas, um, if you are going to transmit for only one second, uh, then you can transmit a little bit more power. Now, I see. in general, we're talking about putting out sine waves because you usually have to transmit for some period of time. But you're right, that may seem strange, but that is how the guideline is. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Professor, Ra Professor Ravi. Yeah, uh, good, good morning, uh, Dr. Cindy. Uh, Hi. This is, yeah, uh, this is Dr. Ravishekar. Actually, I have a doubt. Uh, uh, when you put an implant antenna, what are the effects of uh, your blood veins? Mm. And the blood is made of a lot of iron content. Basically, mm. iron is also there uh, and the other minerals will be there. So Because uh, those are the conductive materials that will uh, reduce a lot of gain. So how yeah. does it impact uh, on your uh, implantable antenna? Okay. Um, all of the different tissues in the body have different uh, conductivity and different permittivity. And you are absolutely right that blood tends to be conductive. It's not as conductive as brain or as cerebral spinal fluid though, for example. So there are other things that are even more conductive in the body than blood. Even though blood has iron in it, it's not enough to make it very magnetic. It is so weakly magnetic. Now think about the MRI and why we have to use such a huge magnet in order to precess the, the the tissues, and that's because we're really not very magnetic. So in all of these applications, we are considering the body to be non-magnetic, which is appropriate at these frequencies and these uh, magnitudes. So yes, the conductivity of the blood, the conductivity of all the different body tissues is actually really important to consider. So when I mentioned that one of the primary concepts that was developed throughout the 80s and 90s that made these implants possible was the ability to do really good simulations of them that include detailed body models. So it is important to consider the electrical properties. It's not as important to consider the magnetic properties in these ranges. Um, and yes, it does matter if you have, for example, a blood vessel versus, you know, the chest wall and so on. So modeling these in their biological environment is actually important. Okay, okay. Uh, someone has. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Hismelis. Hisme Laziz. I am so sorry if I. I, I that, that's, sorry, that's my. Uh, the, the problems from my side. This is Herman. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, well, in, in case of uh, antennas working outside the body and on body, we're interested in uh, reducing SAR limits, uh, SAR, 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 amount of SAR, and uh, we try to, to, to make the radiation basically uh, uh, like not toward the body, out toward mm -hmm. the body. And then that's in the case of antennas on the body, but what in the case of uh, antennas implanted, uh, mm -hmm. for example, in this case, in this slide, you see, we have uh, on the top you have skin and maybe some fat and the bottom you have muscles then it uh, doesn't make sense to work on uh, radiations to make it radiate out toward the body and which one is more uh, in danger the skin at that time or the muscle ah uh, so this is an interesting question so you're absolutely right if you have if you have a wearable antenna of some kind or a sticker antenna you want to make or even a cell phone 
you want to make it radiate away from the body and not into the body. That's absolutely true for all the external antennas. In this case, you've wrapped the body around your antenna, you're sort of stuck with it. So it doesn't really matter which direction you transmit, it's going to be touching body tissue and all of those have SAR guidelines. The SAR guideline does not depend on the type of tissue. So we don't say the skin is safer than the muscle or safer than the fat. So as antenna designers, you pretty much know that the highest field for your antenna is at the feed point. So what you have to do is separate the field point electrically from the body enough that the high SAR there has been reduced. So we will actually do that with a superstrate. And it's why we can't just do like a paint on superstrate. It actually ends up being relatively thick. So yeah, we have to insulate the body that way. And it's basically by separation. So it's not direction, it's by separation. Okay, two more questions. Har Harshpreet, Harshpreet. Harshpreet, you are unmuted. Harshpreet Bhakshi. Um, maybe can we take the next question? Nagarjun Bhatt, okay. he's unmuted sir. Hi, Professor, uh, once again. Um, so like in remote sensing, uh, there are certain windows in frequencies, like I think one is at 22 gigahertz for water. Uh, I'm just wondering if there have been studies that characterize losses in body uh, and are there any higher frequencies where you can find a window like this mm. uh, that would benefit the community? Okay, there have been studies. Um, unfortunately, not really. Um, the body really is lossy throughout all of the frequency ranges. And so the higher you go, kind of the worse it is. There really aren't any windows. Um, we would love it if there were, but no, not really. So that's again, why the trade-off and that's why we're in the 401 to 406 megahertz uh, range. Hmm. So. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. all right, let me go forward now because I can see we're getting a little close on time. So here's the PFA in the body. And if I put this radiator in the body right now, it would short out and it wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't act like an antenna. It would, it would act like an electrode instead. And that's not what we want at all. So we're gonna to have to use a super straight. And the super straight is used to insulate this radiator from the body tissue, both for the sake of making it work at all and also because of the SAR guidelines. So you'll notice I drew it as relatively thick. It is relatively thick on the order of several millimeters typically. So here's the effect of the substrate and the superstrate. Substrate's blue, superstrate's green. As you increase the dielectric constant, you're going to drop the frequency in both cases. So that's generally what you try to do is use a higher, a kind of the highest efficient sub, uh, high dielectric that you can. So you're trying for efficiency. So you want it to have low loss and, and yet you want it to have high dielectric. So that's what we're usually shooting for. Okay, so the spiral PIFA really kind of took off in research for a while through 2004, 2006. Uh, the serpentine antenna, we see interestingly, antennas can either be used for transmission or they can use, be used for sensing. A lot of times if it's a bad transmitter, it's a good sensor. So it turns out that you can do continuous blood glucose monitoring at the same frequencies with a nice little serpentine antenna. Very similar in shape, but uh, different application. Here's a spiral microstrip PIFA uh, also done in, by 2011. Uh, these were extended to three-dimensional designs, uh, either printed flat or wrapped around. These became really uh, important for capsule type applications. And then here's one that we did that was just, that was really fun and actually it works really well, is a genetic algorithm where you take random collections of squares that are either copper, that's the shiny part, or air, that's not, and you breed them, you take two of them and you cross them. If they both have copper, the baby has copper. If they both have air, the baby has air. And if they are copper and air, then you randomly choose. So you kind of take these mommy antennas and daddy antennas, you make a bunch of baby antennas and you test them and you see which ones are good. You throw out the bad ones and you do it again. And by breeding these antennas, you actually can make the best possible antenna, although you rarely understand how it really works. Works well, but you may not understand why, as we often don't. 
So the ideas that have brought us today's implant are of course these standards, the simulation and design tools, the antenna type, being able to, to do antennas that use a good ground plane, the, the effect of a finite ground plane on the implant case, and the biocompatibility of using these different materials. So now let's talk about bandwidth and frequency. So broadbanding techniques we saw throughout the 1980s, and these very quickly came into the medical implant system as well. So you'll see a bunch of multi-layer multi designs for broadbanding. You'll see a bunch of, here are some more multi-layer designs. So both multi-layer and multi-shape designs. Um, here again, our multi-layer designs. Notice the, the spiral that actually has multiple spirals and various shorting pins between them. So a lot of broad banding was done. Here's a three-band rectenna made from three layers. And then in all of these, okay, that's great. I'll tell you the tr biggest trouble we were having throughout our lab in this time is that it was really hard to make an antenna and we were just testing them in a fish tank. We weren't actually testing them even in people's bodies, but they would leak you'd get all kinds of fluid in there. So producing them was very difficult. So we ended up working with a company and ended up with a really cool manufacturing design. Instead of thinking of gluing things onto the pacemaker, the titanium, titanium doesn't hold glue well. Instead, we thought about turning everything upside down. So we first manufactured the super straight, laid the antenna material on top, laid the substrate on top of that, and then laid the ground plane on top. So this actually made a much better design for us and the glues they had available were better than the glues that I had. So these were several of the designs that we're dealing with. Now, let me show you the problem now. So that's the past and we can build antennas on pacemakers and they work, that's great. But the next generation is actually taking the advances in battery technology and of course integrated circuits and being able to package everything on the back of the electrodes themselves. The Utah electrode array is four millimeters squared. It has a hundred electrodes, 10 by 10. Really good for both reception, neural recording and neural transmission, but it's really little. It's the, it's the improvements in batteries that are driving this because the battery is really the big part of this pacemaker. So as battery technology, think electric cars, as battery technology improves, the medical implants are going to shrink. That doesn't change the laws of physics. Just because this shrink shrinks, I can't actually go up in frequency and expect to be able to transmit further. Now this electrode is going to be implanted not on the surface of the skin, like the battery pack is today, or not just under the surface of the skin, it's gonna be deep inside the heart. So it actually, we have to be able to go deeper and we have to be smaller. So we're gonna stay at the same frequency, um, but how are we going to get so small? So the challenge is of course, wavelength at 403 megahertz, 36 centimeters in free space, five to six centimeters in the body. And then how am I gonna get that down to a four millimeter size? So one of the nice things about deciding, I think this is impossible, is that it makes you actually think, okay, if that is impossible, what's an entirely different way of doing this? So we do need a bigger antenna and we can have a bigger antenna actually, because there are places we can put the antenna in and on the body that are bigger. So for example, the fat layer is actually like a semi-insulator. You know how we have semiconductors? Well, the fat layer is like a semi-insulator and you can actually put conductive materials in the fat layer and they will act like an antenna. In fact, the original quote tattoo antennas are actually stickers on the outside of the body, you know, like children's stick on tattoos that you might get at the store. Well, if you tattoo it literally in the fat layer, it acts very much like those that are just on the surface. So in the fat layer and on the surface, the antennas act very, very similar. This allows us to tattoo near the surface in the low loss fat area, the antennas can be large. The feed system on the implanted device can be small and the coupling through, in this case, just a few centimeters of tissue can, in, can connect the implant to the surface tattoo. Now, this is not allowing me to go many centimeters. It is allowing us to go a few centimeters. So there are several materials that potentially could be used for this. And one of the important, one of the uh, good things for antenna designers is that there is so much work happening in conductive and biocompatible materials that there are going to be many materials available within three to five years that aren't available today. It's one of the areas that's going to change our field. 
So copper tape is one of the things that I include in here, not because it's biocompatible, it isn't, but because it's like the gold standard. We can, uh, copper is a good material. We know how antennas work with copper. It has conductivity on the order of 10 to the seventh. Copper mesh also, and we use copper mesh just to represent what would happen if we had a mesh or incomplete material made from biologically compatible substrate. Now, neither of those are compatible. A gold nanoparticle material, however, is, and gold nanoparticle materials can be made on the order of 10 to the seventh. So there can be really high conductivity too. And then inks of various kinds are typically on the order of 10 to the fifth in conductivity, maybe as high as 10 to the seventh. And although the specific inks available today are not biocompatible, I am told by my uh, friends in chemical engineering that they could be made in biocompatible substrates. So um, we consider these as possibilities. So these are some of the materials available today. When you try all these different materials, and this is just a measurement in free space, just so we could compare them, you can actually see that the gold nanoparticle material works really extremely well, works almost as well as the coppers. So we like these materials, good materials. So we tried a tattoo test. Now, one of the first things we tried was actually tattooing, you know, using the machine that goes that injects little bits of material. Trouble is that doesn't make a good tattoo. It does not make a good conductive material. Even if you use conductive like gold itself, um, you end up with too much encapsulation. So the gold particles don't touch each other well enough to make a good conductive antenna. So really think instead of either doing a paint or an injection. Doctors say we're fine being able to inject large materials, especially when the patient is under um, anesthesia. So, so don't worry about injecting it, we can do that. So we tested these um, compatible, these very biocompatible materials and found that we could in fact make a reasonable antenna around the 402 to 405 megahertz range. So we were pleased with that. And oops, let's see. Um, here is copper tape and a gold nanoparticle. The gold nanoparticle material is literally uh, biocompatible. So you can see that if we make um, a gold nanoparticle material, it's very similar to copper. So we can really get a good material that's biocompatible. Um, here are the current distributions on various antennas. And this is in a pork loin test. So we put this antenna in pork loin and we insulated it in various ways. We put the dipole antenna directly on pork. And you'll notice right here, it doesn't really use the whole length of dipole, it's shorted out. We tried putting the, just like a thin saran wrap above it and it works substantially better. If we put fat in between the dipole and the pork, it works even better. And it works about the same as if we put a plastic layer in there as well. So the fat proved to be a decent insulator. We were pleased with that. So, now I'm going to show you a new material that is being developed by my colleague, Juan and Zhang, and it is a thermally activated biopolymer. So it's a biopolymer, polymer, which means it totally can be put in the body and left there long-term. And it's fluid when it's less than 40 degrees C and it gels at something above 40 degrees C. And they can actually control the gelling temperature by the way they build the material. The material is made from two different materials. One is a polymer chain, the other is a cross-linker. The cross-linker is shown as the red lines. And if you put the cross-linker in a small capsule, basically a nano bubble, you can keep the two materials apart, sort of like epoxy. If you mix them, it hardens. And in this case, we're holding one element of the epoxy in little bubbles, so it can't mix. But then if you use heat to break the little capsules or bubbles, they release the cross-linker, which makes the material solidify. You can control how solid it is by how much cross-linker you use, and you can control when it becomes solid by the size and shape of the capsules and the heat that, it, that is required to break these capsules. So this is one of the concepts that is really cool to be available for our, net, for our biocompatible antennas. So here is a picture where we used a cardiac ablation probe, literally that same probe, and we put it in the polymer and we were able to get the solidification right here on the tip as we were hoping. So this is kind of like being able to 3D print with this, this RFCA probe. We could actually print exactly where we want this material in the body. So I'm going to show you a video. I think this is gonna play. So we we turn the power on. See it being able to cross link. 
see it solidifying and how quickly it solidifies. So that's the, that's the ability to solidify with RF um, energy. Now it's important because we actually tried using the ultrasound energy, focused ultrasound, but it didn't cross-link well. So the microwave energy was much better. So if we could do that, let's go back to the concept of trying to get the energy deeper into the body. One way to do that is to use an antenna that's larger and if you imagine that these two black lines were wires, they could take a plane wave from outside the body and actually focus it at the tips. Things focus at tips and gaps in electromagnetics. And so you can actually focus the energy right here and you could put an antenna, you could put your small antenna down here at the bottom and it would have collected the fields from a large distance. So we found that by being able to do this uh, using two conductive materials here, we could actually get about 16 times as much power down here to the implant. Now, putting actual wire in the body wouldn't be, bio, wouldn't be ideal medically, but instead we'd like to use the biocompatible polymer, which could be made soft. So for example, if you're going through muscle, you'd make it have the solidification of roughly muscle. Now, how well do these things have to be aligned? Fortunately, not too well at all. The shape and size of this, um, this gap is pretty flexible. And so just being able to have this antenna somewhere below here, kind of close, not directly connected, actually allows us to augment the power down here where the, the implant is. So the concept here was using standard electromagnetics to augment our field in the place that our antenna is located. Now coming back to the coaxial heating probe, remember that I showed you on the very first slide and this is how we would propose to use it. So using a 24 megahertz generator with an open-ended coax, you can inject the polymer and back the heating device out as you go. So it's like printing a wire inside the body with an injectable heating device that makes it solidify as it goes. So this is our proposal for how to actually build these focusing lenses for these antennas. And then your implantable medical device would be low. Now I've, I've shown a full size uh, cardiac pacemaker here. This would actually be the smaller four millimeter device. So this is a microwave applicator, a biocompatible material and some heating. So the next generation of antennas for medical implants are going to grow in the number of applications, the more things that you might want to read within the body and the more things that you might want to stimulate within the body and the more sensors that you might want to be able to produce in the body. So the number of applications will undoubtedly continue to rise dramatically and the size and configure of the configuration of these is guaranteed to shrink. So as antenna designers, we have to be able to make antennas that are smaller and smaller or if we cannot, and I'm proposing that in many cases it's difficult to get as small as we like, we may want to consider other opportunities for making our antennas bigger and different. So more applications and smaller devices. So these were the ideas that we used before, and now we have the polymer as an interesting tool, conductive, biocompatible, soft heat controlled materials, and the, heat, the ability to heat them. So that's where I think medical antennas are headed next. Much more flexible, much more opportunity, and many, many more applications. So thank you for letting me join you today. I wonder if you have any more questions. And again, here's the website on the bottom where you can find additional of our papers if you wish. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Okay. So we can take questions. Um, first, I would like to request all the participants to make sure their name is displayed on the uh, Zoom window so that we can register you, uh, check you in. Uh, please uh, make sure that your name is uh, shown on the participant list. Some of you have uh, mobile numbers, uh, different uh, email address or something, so please make sure. Okay, so uh, first question, um, I'm gonna unmute. Uh, Harshpreet, um, we, we, I think you tried to ask a question. Um, last time so i'm not sure if uh, yeah yeah please ashpri go ahead i i think you can unmute now
can you hear me? Hello? Yes. 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 yes we can hear Hi. You. Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, I just had a. This was a wild idea, and maybe have has a lot of limitations. But how about wireless power transfer uh, to recharge batteries uh, instead of, I guess, repeated surgeries to change the drain batteries? So, if you could throw some light on that, please. Actually, wireless power transfer is used in almost all devices today. Remember, Sam was some time ago. So the small battery that is in the titanium battery pack is generally um, recharged using inductive coupling for wireless power transfer. So absolutely, it's, absol it's absolutely necessary. And as Got the it. battery is smaller, even though there'll be better, stronger batteries, they're going to have to be um, charged as well. So yes, it's a really important aspect of implantable devices. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, next okay. question is Colin. Colin Day. Please unmute yourself. Hi, Dr. First. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I wanted to just ask one clarification and then a, a bigger pick, bigger look picture. Um, first off, you you were adding the super super straight to address SAR or was it also something else? Okay. So the it's, it actually has multiple applications. If you don't have a super straight, you are going to short your antenna out because the body's really quite conductive. Think of dropping your antenna, think of dropping your, your cell phone into the wash. You know it shorts it out. So, but, what, but isn't the substrate of the, of the pacemaker itself, isn't that enough to isolate it? No, it isn't actually because you've got the metal structure of the antenna on top and then the body on top of that. So you still have to insulate that from the body. You have to make it so the metal of the antenna is not touching the body or else what happens is the current, instead of going from the feed point of the antenna down to the tip of the antenna, goes from the feed point out into the body. Conducted, it's conducted, that's where the current goes. Okay. So you have to insulate that metal part of the antenna from the lossy body. And so you're gonna to have to put a sheet of plastic or something there anyway. Now the question is going to be, so that, that's gonna take care of the conductive losses, like the current actually leaving. Um, but because we're electromagnetics, we also have coupling, field coupling directly to the body. And if you have too much of that, it also shorts it out. So you've gotta make your substrate thick enough, super straight thick enough that it prevents that um, coupling. At the same time, it's reducing the SAR. So it's going to be both making the antenna act like the full length that you are designing it to be, and also reducing the SAR. So it has multiple applications. Okay, great, thanks. And um, for the communication, so you're adding these kind of coupling antennas, I guess, if you wanna call them that are embedded or the tattoo style, right? I don't know if that's a fair to what, yeah. to how to address them, but how much of a pull is there for higher efficiency, higher gain on these antennas? Because I, I assume the distances are kind of for in-room communication, like they're not really trying to communicate out to a neighborhood cell tower or something like that. Is that <laughs> no, in fact, uh, they're generally on-body networks, which means the furthest you would, con you would go it would be to a cell phone holder on the hip. So, or rat, or rat cages or um, primate cages, so how much which might be a few meters. So how much pull is there from the industry for you know, uh, increased efficiencies on these antennas? I am positive that the, if we were to have some substantial improvements in efficiency, that would be a good thing. The challenge that I'm looking at addressing right now is a challenge that's not actually quite in the industry yet because these four millimeter devices aren't really industry ready. But when you're a professor, you generally work 10 sure. to 15 sure. years out. And within 10 years, battery technology is going to be sufficient to make these four millimeter things reality. And at that point, they need an industry solution. So there's not really a pull today for a four millimeter antenna, but there will be. Fair enough. Uh, thanks very much. And sorry, the difference between a super straight and a substrate was? The substrate's on the bottom. So, that, so it's- It's just titanium. location. Yeah, uh -huh. there's titanium okay. and then there's sub and then there's the antenna and then there's super. They could be the same materials. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Abbas. Hi, thank you very much for a great presentation. Thank you. 
So the question I have is regarding that your polymer idea. The polymer is not a conductive material. How can we make it conductive? So that's what the material sciences or scientists work on. And the answer is yes, conductive polymers are coming. Um, you have to include conductive materials in the polymers in this in the polymer basis. So for example, um, uh, carbon nanotubes are already embeddable in polymers and can be used for conductive applications. The trouble is they're not biocompatible. And so those haven't really reached a biocompatibility stage. Uh, gold nanoparticles, which could also be made like long filaments, potentially could be added to the polymers. That's, that's what the gold nanocomposite material I showed you is. So the, the antenna that's made from the gold nanocomposite is a polymer with a gold, um, like long gold filament that's embedded in the polymer itself. So it's a combination of the polymer plus a conductive material. And there is a big push in this area in, in uh, material science. So materials like this are coming for us. So exactly the material I want isn't quite ready today, but it is coming. Jihan, so, question. Um, so I'm sorry if this sounds a little basic, but uh, usually they have to cut open the patient to put in the uh, the antenna or the device. So when closing the wound, usually, uh, if I'm correct, surgeons use bio staples or some kind of a uh, uh, a thread which is stitching to close the wound could that be exploited to enhance the um, uh, pa power or the ra radiation from the uh, antenna so that's a really interesting question um, quite many years ago I'm thinking it must be the 90s there was a proposal to use the staples which are metal um, that are used to close a chest wound so the staples that go around the sternum as because they'd be like staple, round, staple, round, staple, round, staple. Um, those were proposed as antenna options. So possibly. Now stitching, maybe not, because that would be the, um, the skin and probably people aren't going to want metal stitches left in their skin. And so maybe not the outside, but certainly there have been some proposals for being able to use the staples themselves, particularly when they're put on bone and they don't move. So, yeah, but most surgeries today are actually done with biodegradable materials, which means you might put a staple in, but it's not going to stay. It's going to disperse. And of course, um, stitches generally are absorbed by the body or removed. Okay. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's a good thought. Um, medically, maybe still complicated. Um, next question, Mauricio, what is? Yes, Mar uh, yes um, thank you, Cynthia, for your very nice presentation. Uh, I have a few questions. I mean, first, uh, when talking about uh, superstrate and substrate, you mentioned that uh, the highest uh, permittivity, the better. I mean, the smaller we can do the antennas, but mm -hmm. what are the limitations? What is the highest that we can go? Oh. And what, what are the limitations in the fabrication? Okay, those are really good questions. And those would be material science questions as well. Materials that you typically can find that have low conductivity and high dielectric, may go up as high as 20 to 40. I'm vaguely thinking there was a 60, epsilon r is 60 that I've seen, but I, uh, I'm thinking 10, 20 is common. Usually as you go higher dielectric, you also start to get higher conductivity, which isn't an advantage. You want low conductivity, high dielectric. So it's limited by the materials that are available. Now, as far as the manufacturing, the higher dielectric materials tend to be more brittle. Um, at least I'm told, at least I'm told they are. So yeah, there are some limitations, I'm sure. If you can make them higher, highest possible dielectric, lowest possible conductivity, that's what you're after. Okay, and the next question is, um, um, what about ultra wide band uh, ant uh, antennas or ultra wide band uh, applications? 
Okay, so that's a really interesting question for ultra wideband. Um, currently, the guy, the the frequency that's allowed is 401 to 406 megahertz. And in fact, you can't even use that whole frequency. You get a section of it. So medically, there isn't an ultra wideband standard that would enable this. So it's not so much ultra wideband. Now, could it be multiband? Yes, because there are multiband antennas that use a low frequency for wireless power transfer and a higher frequency for communication. So you may have a dual band antenna, but you probably won't have a broadband antenna because of the standards. Okay, I, I hear that uh, it was just um, uh, 3G has to 10 GHz. Um, and that there is, but now I cannot re recall the, the standard. For that, uh, but yes, um, and what about, um, um, is, I mean, I, I, I understand that uh, because of the medical implant communication service and also because of the wireless medical telemetry services, uh, four, gigahertz, uh, four megahertz band is not mostly the most used as I understand, but um, th there are also uh, development on 2.4 gigahertz and in 5.2 gigahertz as well, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, and maybe less on the highest frequency because of obvious reasons also on penetration. Mm -hmm. So the other frequencies are used for other applications, such as heating. So 2450 is routinely used in heating applications, but not in communication ac applications as much now that we have the medical implant communication system services band. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question, Chuck Pagano. Who are you? Hi, doctor. How about quick question about collecting SAR data on these implants as they go deeper and deeper inside the body. What are some strategies for collecting SAR data that would be acceptable to regulators? Oh, that's a good question. And I am not up on that right now. So okay. the devices that I have seen most frequently used are the, the very small electromagnetic probes, the three field probes, three axis probes. Like the uh, speed on probes? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and being able to use those with a biological phantom, typically. They won't be done in a real animal. Is she um, fluid? Yes, so those would be the, um, the measurement method. But with cell phones, you can evaluate your SAR standard with both measurement or with simulation. So I'm assuming it would be the same for the others as well. But okay. I haven't done these measurements recently. So. The SAR systems usually tend to measure at the scanner several millimeters below the skin. And that's kind of the standard system. We're trying to figure out some strategies for collecting useful data as you go deeper and deeper in the tissue simulation. So the way that cell phones used to be measured, uh, still are, sorry, the, the way that cell phones were designed to be measured is you put the cell phone, turn it this way and make a head phantom. Yep. And then you bring in a, the probe from the top. I would think you would do the same thing with these devices, but I really haven't seen the measurement methods for these. So they have to be invented. Yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Arka Jyoti. Hi, um, thanks for uh, your presentation, Dr. Purse. Um, I was wondering, uh, since the uh, loss is mostly through the body tissue, um, how would you uh, rate the antennas that are printed on fabric maybe as a cheaper alternative? Are they like reliable? Okay, so if you have an implantable medical device, you need an implant that's inside the body and you're not going to do that on fabric. So you're gonna be stuck with these implants and they do go through the body and it is really lossy. If you have an antenna that's printed on the fabric, that's for a wearable application, kind of an entirely different application. Those antennas will almost always be better than those that are implanted inside the body. And as one of the questioners mentioned earlier in the talk, you typically would put a ground plane underneath and then your antenna on top to try to make sure the field didn't go into the body. You don't want it to for SAR reasons and you don't want it to for loss reasons. So the, the wearables will be a pretty different application. And yeah, those antennas are going to be more efficient. Next question, uh, Sisoman. 
Can you please unmute? Uh, Sisoman, are you with us? Okay, let's move on. Uh, Francesco. Thank you, Dr. First. Uh, exceptional discussion, very interesting. Uh, two quick things, two quick questions. Uh, one, uh, you mentioned about the printable electrodes and uh, how to extend the antenna, uh, but uh, doesn't that cause a problem with the fact, as you mentioned, that the object inside the body actually will tend to move and therefore maintaining the alignment of that wouldn't be a little bit uh, challenging in the long term? So certainly it's a, this is an issue and it's something that needs to be considered when you're doing this design. What we found was the, the gap does not have to be so tiny and you can make it a little bit bigger. And that means that your alignment is no longer quite as critical. So you can play some tricks to improve the alignment opportunities. Um, and what's probably more important is the vertical alignment. So being able to keep it as close to those tips as possible. And it wouldn't frankly hurt if the tips did touch it. That would actually be okay as well. So thank is you. alignment a problem? It is. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Second quick question uh, for the four millimeter challenge uh, for 10 yeah. years from now. Uh, wouldn't you want to use potentially uh, some meta material to mm -hmm. actually change the epsilon and mu? But obviously that uh, poses the challenge that now you're going to have very directional type of antenna. Is that a uh, possible mm -hmm. solution? So that's a really interesting question and surely metamaterials could have a place here. So when you do the metamaterials, what you're trying to do probably is effectively increase the dielectric constant. Yes. So you'd have higher dielectric constant Thousands. materials. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Yep. And that would help to shrink the antenna physically. Yes. So that's a definite possibility. Now, are you going to make this antenna really more focused? In the body, I don't think so. It's not going to work the same way as it does in air because the body always pulls the fields away yeah. because of the conductivity. So I don't think you're going to get a highly directional antenna. Um, you are going to get a very tiny antenna. Um, and could you use the meta materials to improve this? Yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Nagarjun Bhatt. Please go. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for an amazing presentation. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, I took a course in semiconductor device and I was just kind of thinking about an idea. Um, has graphene ever been explored as a potential material um, for implantable antennas? Um, there are some questions about how biocompatible it is, but if it were, would that be a good option as well? Because graphene can be made really, really thin, like atomically thin. Um, so yes. that that's a super interesting question because not only can graphene be very thin, but it can also be really long. Right. So if you were to use graphene particles in a say polymer mesh or any other kind of mesh, um, you, can, you don't need as many of these molecules to make a good conductor as you would say small spherical molecules. So graphene has been looked at for use in conductive polymers um, but yes, there is a real question about its biocompatibility. Now, biocompatibility, as I mentioned before, can happen two ways. One of them is that you manage to encapsulate this material so it can't escape, so it's held in place and it can't really get out into the body. So could it be encapsulated well enough? Maybe. Um, the other possibility is if the particle is uh, toxic. So for example, gold is non-toxic, but graphene does appear to be toxic. So it would have to be encapsulated well enough that it can't escape into the body. Uh, just one other small question is, have um, dielectric resonator antennas ever been explored for like uh, implanting in the body? I don't know that I've seen them. So okay. maybe, maybe I've missed it, but no, I haven't seen that. Okay. Because like uh, you were talking about the body actually shorting out the antenna uh, when it's in contact. So just wondering how it would work in the case of a dielectric resonator antenna, because you, you probably wouldn't have the problem with those kinds of antennas. So I don't know that these have been explored. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what's good? Hey. Uh, uh, hi, Professor. Thank, thanks again for an excellent uh, discussion. So my question has to do with uh, electrical, electrically steerable or tunable antennas. Like, do you see any 
advantage or application to having those features uh, in this uh, implantable antennas? No question. Particularly the electrical tuning is one of the things we actually brought up a decade ago, because if the antenna is going to move within the body or, or there's another reason to, when we design these electric, when we design all of these materials, we're using the average electrical properties of the body. But it turns out there's actually huge variability in the electrical properties of the body um, from person to person, from time of day to early time of day to late time of day, age, um, and just the uncertainty of measurement. If you were to measure across one kidney, for example, you're going to get quite a lot of different values. So the electrical properties aren't as perfectly known as we are treating them in our numerical simulations. Consequently, when we design our antennas, if you had designed them for a body that had one property, but really it had a different property that might vary by 10 or 20%, um, then you know that your antenna isn't going to behave exactly the same and you would need to tune it for that property of the body, whether it's moved to a different place or you just didn't know what it was in the first place when you were implanting it in this person, or if the person you know, is a little bit more dehydrated during this part of the day. So being able to tune your antenna would undoubtedly be a good thing. Now, being able to steer your antenna is an interesting thing. That implies that your antenna would need to be more directional. If you were able to steer your antenna and have a more directional antenna, that would be great. But I think so far it's looked like the body is pretty much prohibiting that unless you're quite close to the surface. It's going to be hard to get a very directional antenna. Okay, so uh, the last question for the evening, um, Sisaman, uh, can you please answer? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, can, you, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. yeah. I've lost it the first time. Uh, um, I'd like to ask a question about the, um, for lack of a better description, the, the coat hanger uh, uh, focuser. And I, I wondered if um, if the um, implantable um, stent can, can be used for uh, for that shape. Mm -hmm. And then the follow up question is, uh, uh, could could that structure be used to enhance the uh, the backscatter mode of communication? So the first question is, could a stent be used instead of these? wires, these polymer wires. And if you, so a stent is normally placed in an artery or a vein because it's used, you know, for those applications. So in that case, yes, if you did have an artery or a vein that was in the correct location, potentially you could use a stent, I suppose. Um, most stents are a whole lot shorter than what we are physically showing here. So that gives it a limitation as well. Um, but is that possible? The stent is definitely a medical material that is, uh, sorry, a metal material that's used medically. So it has the potential for use in electromagnetic applications as well. I'm not sure it's necessarily going to replace this. I like your coat hanger. It's not necessarily gonna replace the coat hanger with the polymers. And I don't know if you would want it to, The the polymer material can be made soft and compliant with the body whereas the stent is not as compliant. It works inside a blood vessel because they're actually really stiff-sided. Um, so that's why the stent works for those medical applications. I don't know that it would work here, but maybe some, maybe for a different application. Thank you. Okay. okay. I think we have a last, last question from Francisco uh, for the evening. So Francisco, can you please go? Sure, thank you. And sorry, uh, more than a question is really a comment. Uh, uh, since uh, you mentioned about uh, the tunability requirements of the antenna as things change, just wanted to let you know that in the past we developed uh, a very high Q tunable capacitor for 5G type of communication that can be embedded in any standard silicon process. So in case you're interested to use such technologies uh, for your experiments, I can mm. provide you some information. Okay, so the ability to tune it with a high Q capacitor, that's, that's definitely interesting. But yeah, feel free to email me. So definitely I will, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think with that, Dr. Cindy Force, it has been a fantastic talk and I, I have myself personally learned a lot about implantable antennas and our audience, you, you, could, you could see that there has been a lot of overwhelming response from the audience and it has been a fantastic talk. We would like to thank you on behalf of our Santa Clara San Francisco MTTS chapter. Um, it, was, it was our pleasure having you. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure to join you tonight. So, 
enjoy the rest of your week and uh, yeah, the- we actually yeah we, we have a uh, concluding slides um just uh, i'm going to share the uh, screen now yeah. um we will introduce our next uh, uh next uh talk um so i would like to invite uh, tom for um um for introducing the next talk just give me one second i'm going to share my slides uh, okay Yes, Dr. First, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate it. And I really appreciate your uh, taking everyone's question and um, really engaging with our our, our, uh, our team here. Thanks, thanks so much and our audience here. It's been a delight. All right. Um, so uh, that kind of—I I would ask that if you just go ahead and introduce the next month's speaker, I, I would appreciate yeah. it. Uh, uh, Tom, I'm sharing the slides. Uh, do you want to go ahead? Uh, you could—you could go ahead and introduce. Uh, okay. Um, so let me take uh, the pleasure of introducing our next talk. Uh, the next talk um, is confluence of electromagnetics, circuits, and systems uh, enables the third wireless revolution by Dr. Harish Krishna Swami. Harish Krishna Swami uh, is an associate professor of electrical engineering and the director of the Columbia High Speed and Millimeter Wave IC Laboratory at Columbia University, New York, USA. He currently serves as a distinguished lecturer for the IEEE Solid State Circuit Society and as a member of DARPA Microelectronics Exploratory Council. Our next talk is on Wednesday, June 16th, 2021, uh, at the same time, 7 p.m. to uh, 7.45 p.m. U.S. Pacific time. The abstract of the talk is going to be, I'm sorry, uh, is going to be integrated circuits, a few, several revolutions that have deeply impacted modern society, including the computing revolution, the internet, and the first two wireless revolutions. We are at the dawn of the third wireless revolution, which I call the wireless mobility, mobile reality revolution, excuse me. Over the next 15 years, new wireless paradigms spanning from radio frequency to millimeter wave and terahertz have, uh, will change the way in which we interact with the real world through applications such as mobile virtual and augmented reality, vision quality imaging, gesture recognition, and bio and material sensing. This talk will describe research along these lines from the cosmic lab at the Columbia University, including a new approach to breaking Lorentz reciprocity to engineer high performance non-reciprocal components such as carators, isolators, and circulators, and how these integrated non-reciprocal circulators enable the practical integrated full duplex wireless radios. It will describe the FlexCon project at Columbia, which is taking holistic and cross-layer view of full duplex networks from the physical layer to the networking layer, it will also briefly touch upon the work from Cosmic Lab in the same VN related to high power, high, effic high efficiency millimeter wave radios, MIMO radios, up to electronic LIDARs and CT scale wireless test threads. Uh, with that, we would like to um, thank Dr. Cindy Farsi first one more time, and we would like to conclude our talk this evening uh, with a remark that, you know, please support us by becoming a member at IEEE and also MTTS chapter. And, please follow the hashtag MTTSSCV um, on LinkedIn. Thank you, Dr. First, and thank you, audience, for your uh, overwhelming response this evening. Well, thank you so much. It's been great to join you. OK, with that, um, I'm going to stop recording, and that concludes our uh, talk this evening. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night.